away in case you might need to exit. Uh, first of all, I'd like to remind you that the Vicksburg Historical Society is having their last program on the 19th of November at 7 o'clock in the Vicksburg Community Center, and it will be about Vicksburg trains. And our speaker, oh, we had originally planned for Gerald Smith, that most of you know is Smitty, but he is ill. And Jim Bird has agreed to be our speaker that night. Also, the Vicksburg Historical Society only has one fundraiser every year. And that fundraiser is our annual bake sale, which will be the first Saturday in December, which this year falls on December 7th, which is for Harbor Day. So from 9 to 3, if you want to drop by and pick up some goodies, please do so at the Depot Museum on December the 7th. Uh, this year again, Sally Cutshaw and her brother Bill Reed have donated a peppermint candy basket. And the basket was made following their grandfather's recipes. It's filled with homemade goodies and we're raffling it off. Those tickets will also be on uh, sale at the bake sale. The ticket, you have to put your name and your phone number on the back of the ticket. And that ticket will be drawn uh, for the end of the bake sale and you, the winner will be given a call and they get the basket. Also, I would like to thank Tim Fuller and the crew here at the Performing Arts Center for working with us. Uh, Christina Aubrey Powers, Powers Aubrey, excuse me, is our producer. Uh, she and um, Karen Hammond and her husband David worked uh, to make our set along with a few items that we pulled uh, from the dungeon downstairs. Uh, also, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ken Franklin, who will be our actor for tonight. Uh, he has put a great deal of time and effort. Some of you may have seen his original interpretation of um, Theodore Roosevelt when he did the school craft uh, two years ago. Well, this one's going to be bigger and better. I'm sure that you will enjoy it. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. I hope you enjoy the play.
The press connects us with the people. And the less shadow in that process, the better, I say. I must, <laughs> I must tell you, I should have given a medal to Charles, the poor Treasury Department uh, messenger who gave me my shave and acted as my barber. I dare say, say that he had countless activities to cut my throat during those afternoon sessions. Uh, as you can see, I do not have a reputation for conversing sedately. <laughs> well, enough of that. Uh, what would you like to ask me this evening? Uh, Mr. President? Yes, sir. Now that your term of office is over, what do you look forward to doing? Well, in the immediate term, I am planning a trip to Africa, which shall take uh, the majority of the year. I've always wanted to visit that continent. I understand the hunting to be most excellent, and I should think that America should start relating to Africa more as partners and less as exploiters. Yes, uh, terrible business, that. We have still not come fully out of that dark night. But more directly to your question, I'm planning to spend the rest of my life here at Sagamore Hill, where I can, excuse me, where I can make this place the home and center of my dear children's lives. Though I dare say they will have lives of their own soon, after all. Alice is 25 and will likely be marrying. It is still my fondest wish that they will find this place a center of joy and family that will last through the generations. I hope that answered your question, sir. Mr. Yes. President. Yes. What inspired you most in your youth that's brought you to this select position? Well, I can assure you that I did not arrive here through any means of self-determination. I can speak to what formed my early character and give credit for my arrival here. I will leave it to you to make any connections between the two. Without a doubt, my dear father set me on the course of my life. As a matter of fact, the celebration of my ascendance to the presidency was severely dampened by the fact that he was not here to see it. He uh, died, away, died over 30 years ago at the age of 46. Tragedy of that. Father was the benefactor of, the of wealth from the family's glass importing business, which prospered even through the Civil War. Oh, I dare say he was one of the wealthiest men in the country. However, his maintenance of that business was merely a vehicle to his true passion, the care and uplift of those less fortunate. You see, Father's philanthropy and athletics were his true passions. And he performed them to the limit. T.D., he would say to me, my father's nickname for me was T.D. <laughs> T.D., he would say to me, Remember, God requires that good fortune be balanced with productive work and public service. He was also fond of saying to me, Whatever you do, enjoy it. <laughs> now, please do not misunderstand. By that, I do not mean that one should only take on pleasurable tasks. One must not shirk duty. Now what he meant was that each of life's duties must be performed with an eye to joy. We must focus on the thrill rather than the drudgery if we are to wring the most out of each of the days of our lives. As for what got me to this position, I credit divine providence first, attention to an active life second, and a duty to every common American constantly. My father emphasized that every one of life's activities be pursued with zeal, and I strive every day to embrace that zeal. I will confess something, however. Do I consider surrender to fear to be a mortal sin? That great man, my father, was the only human I truly feared. Next question, please. Sir, I have two questions for you. Was your father a role model, and were your parents strict? Strict? 
Why, I should think no more than was proper. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Father delighted in placing small treasures in his pockets as he was about on his business errands. And Fanny, Ellie, Coney, and I, oh, I'm sorry, my oldest sister, Anna, was nicknamed Bambi, short for Bambina. My younger siblings were Elliot, Ellie, and Corrine, Coney. And the four of us had an unstated competition to sit next to him when he arrived home and to explore and apportion the treasures in his pockets. <laughs> As for role models, oh yes, assuredly yes. It was delightful to see how much he cared for every individual citizen Excuse me. <clears throat> you see, at that time, New York was two cities, one with privilege and wealth, and one with crushing poverty. Father established the New Newsboys Lodging Home in New York City as a home for the homeless and abandoned youth. We would visit there often, and he would give as much individual attention to each of those boys as he would to a wealthy dinner guest. Yes, it is my dear hope that my life is something my father would approve of. As a matter of fact, I really felt his spirit my first day in the White House. You do realize that September 23rd, 1901, my first day in the building, was his birthday? Yes, uh, excuse me. Uh, Edith and the uh, children were still up here in Sagamore Hill preparing for the unexpected chaos of the move to Washington. And not wishing to be alone, I invited my sisters and their husbands to join me for dinner. It was rather more reserved than our typical meals together. <laughs> but then we received an amazing blessing. You see, the custom of the White House at that, at that time was to place a boutonniere next to the cup with each gentleman's coffee after dinner. And I was amazed to find a yellow saffonia rose next to my cup. It was this exact same rose that Father had grown and tended all through his life, and one always found one in his buttonhole. Providence indeed. It was that blessing that allowed me to get on with the business of healing our country. That answers your question. Mr. President. Yes, sir. I'm interested in your life as a child. Tell me, what hobbies did you have as a child? Ah, well, you must understand that at age three, I became quite ill, first with the asthma and then with cholera morbus. Delicacy forbids me from describing cholera morbus in any detail. Suffice it to say, I knew all of my house's bathrooms intimately. <laughs> my, fret, my parents fretted over the asthma, but the treatments of the day were of little benefit. When I was 12, my father took me aside and said, Theodore, you have not the mind. You have the mind, but you have not the body. And without the body, the mind cannot progress as far as it should. You must make your body. I know it is a hard drudgery to make one's body, but I'm sure you will do it. So I set out a diligent regimen of calisthenics, swimming, and athletics, which, as you can see, worked marvelously. <laughs> uh, and you are well aware of my enjoyment of most athletics, uh, pugilism, and the mar martial arts, and horseback riding. But I have always been fascinated with natural history. I recall when I was seven, my parents sent me to Broadway to fetch some fresh strawberries. Well, a seal had been killed by the dock workers and was laid out on display. By Jove, it fascinated me. I made several trips back and forth to the market, making detailed measurements and descriptions in a small copybook. Well, when the market was finished and disposed of the poor animal, they gave me the skull, which I placed in my bedroom as the first exhibit in what I call the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. <laughs> Unfortunately,
Fontaine Lady item so repulsed the chambermaid that it was relegated to a bookshelf in the back hallway. <laughs> Nevertheless, that started a lifelong fascination with the diversity and wonder that is the natural beauty of the world. Next question, please. Mr. President, how about your family? Can you tell us about your six children? <laughs> I dare say you would have more trouble prohibiting me from talking about them. <laughs> Yes. Oh, but I must preface my remarks. I am a proud father, and as my guest here tonight, I shall enjoy describing them to you. I must insist that you not publish my remarks on this matter. I will never forget the insipid pursuit of young Ted while he was at way at Harvard. Though he assiduously avoided the spotlight, some of your colleagues in the press hounded him relentlessly. Young boy had enough of a problem trying to make his own way with a father in public service. I will not have that repeated. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Believe me. As you said, I have been blessed with six beautiful children. My oldest and greatest treasure, Alice, was given me by my first wife, former Miss Alice Hathaway Lee. Matter of fact, this home was originally to be named Lee Home in her honor. Unfortunately, Alice died in childbirth. Just, just kidney failure just a few hours after the baby was born. To make matters worse, my dear mother, Mitty, died of typhoid fever earlier that same day. not endured such pain since. Thank God for my sister Bammy, who cared for baby Lee while I used work and trips out west to try to struggle with my own grief. I am certain that Alice's fierce independence stems from that unfortunate early abandonment, though I have always loved her so. Young Ted is 22. He was an exuberant child, jubilant from the first. He played more vigorously than any boy I had ever seen, and he has an amazing imagination. He shares my enjoyment of the out of doors. I will never forget the first rifle I brought home from him. It was not very large. And young Ted refused to believe it was real until I actually fired it. Well, after much cajoling, I finally said to him, you must never make mention of this to mother. And I fired it in this very study. <laughs> Made surprisingly little noise. You can barely make out the mark left in the ceiling here. <laughs> yes, uh, Teddy's has ambitions for the New York State Assembly. As I've said, he's 22. Uh, Kermit, 20, has always been a gentle soul. Though not as sharp of wit as my other children, he has a thorough zest for life and a merry spirit. He also shares my passion for hunting in the outdoors, and I fully expect he will be joining me on my trip to Africa later this year. Ethel is nearly 18. And I'm reminded of the remarks of my cousin West, who was the uh, attending physician at the birth. He called Ethel the finest baby of the three physically, which I believe he attributed to her unfortunate inheritance of my build. I swear her legs were like bedposts. <laughs> I gave her the nickname Elephant Chani. <laughs> Not in a derogatory way. She is very attractive and thoroughly able to handle any adversity. Matter of fact, at age three, she swallowed a toadstool and remained thoroughly unaffected. <laughs> Ethel is very interested in that new organization, uh, the American Red Cross. Archie is 15 and Quentin 12. <laughs> Those two are quite the cunning conspirators. 
You may have heard reports of the two of them riding tea trays down the staircases at the White House. Those reports are true. <laughs> the two have an amazing imagination that led to a quite many adventures around Washington, and I thoroughly enjoyed the baseball games they organized with the neighborhood youth in the backyard of the White House. We thoroughly enjoyed each other. And I credit the closeness of my family's house with the exuberance that we share every day of our lives together. I frankly find it a wonder that others do not share that exuberance. I'm reminded of the remarks of my dear friend Cecil Spring Rice, the ambassador from Great Britain to Sweden. He was fond of holding forth and intoning at parties. You must remember, the president is about six. <laughs> Your next question, please. Sir, we want to thank you for hosting us here at Sagamore Hill. What can you tell us about this property? Aha, uh -huh. yes, it is quite the bully place, isn't it? Designed it myself. It is named for Sagamore Mohannes, the Indian chief who signed away the deep rights to the land in the mid-1600s. It has been criticized for its outward appearance, which I suppose is fair. I was never formally trained in Victorian architecture, and the place is deucedly hard to keep warm in the winter. The children often refer to it as the bird cage. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is solid place. The foundations are 20 inches thick, and the structure is sound. It is a solid, permanent, and comfortable place. A place to be lived in. A place to be stable. A place for a family to grow together. Did you see the notation over the front door as you entered the place? Qui plantavit curavit. He who has planted must preserve. Every room, every shelf, every object in this place speaks a story that links the members of our family together. Young Ted likened it to the structure of a coral reef. I find that description most cutting and apt. Next question, please. Mr. President, uh, I imagine with the uh, coral reef motif in your mind, that moving the family from Sycamore Hill to the White House was quite a transition. How did that affect your children? It is Sagamore Hill, sir. Sycamore Hill. Sir. <laughs> well, it was quite a shocking transition. Let me tell you, the country was still reeling after President McKinley's death. He had a, was looking like he was going to recover from that assassin's bullet. And so I went off climbing in the Adirondacks when he suddenly took a turn for the worse and expired. Ted was away at uh, Broughton School and Alice was visiting with relatives, but the rest of us piled into the White House in what has been described as the wildest scramble in the history of the building. I'm proud to say that our personalities were not changed by that old mention. It was there to house us and not to mold us. As a matter of fact, uh, old Ira Smith, the uh, senior gentleman in the, in the mail room, said that we exhibited so much exuberance, personality, and self-expression that Congress was nearly forced to settle the question of whether or not to build a new White House, for the old one was going to be torn apart. <laughs> I recall the words of uh, Ike Hoover, the White House usher. He states that the children found every crawl space in the White House in short order and took to exploring it thoroughly. Archie and Quentin would use the dust bins in their shields and their wooden sword fights and often use the visitors to the White House as tree trunks to duck behind. 
And I'm told that there was a certain unfortunate bald telegraph operator whose head was their favorite bean shooter target. The White House back then was not a place for nervous clerks. Why, one makes time, of course. Key by time to grab it. He who is planted must preserve. As you can see, my time in the presidency is over, and yet my family remains. One must have a sense of priority in one's obligations. Now, of course, I do travel extensively. But I do make it a point to make a regular correspondence with my family. I do enjoy writing to them, and I write often, and I so enjoy hearing from my little bunnies. Next question. Yes, Mr. President. Still interested in your youth, what activities would you and your children enjoy, your family? Well, as you know, well, horseback riding has always been a staple of our lives, and I have mentioned athletics. <laughs> as a matter of fact, the children love to construct marvelous obstacle courses around the barns, and they would have me time them as they tried to uh, better each other's records. The boys are, all enjoy hunting and are quite cunning shots. As a matter of fact, uh, it was when I was learning to shoot that I first discovered I needed these spectacles. These have quite opened the world to me, though we, they can be quite the bother. And finally, I do so appreciate that Mother has instilled in all of my bunnies a fervent love of reading. We've had excellent discussions on the works of uh, Dickens and Kipling, and we have enjoyed quite a variety of poetry. I hope that answers your question. Mr. President, your rise in elected office was quite remarkable. Do you have any stories to share on that? An apt question. Act indeed. In fact, since my career in politics is at an end, I have the opportunity to shed some much needed light in that process. There are those who thrive in the shadows of politics, and I find those shadows pernicious to a true democracy. I speak, of course, of the Tammany Society of New York that execrable organization of Democrats, headed by Mr. William Tweed, had established an amazingly efficient machine trading money and votes for patronage. And had made bribery of many of the city's policemen commonplace. The Republicans had an opportunity to rise above this. But instead, they established a similarly efficient and similarly loathsome machine headed by Mr. Tom Platt, the so-called Easy Boss. The industrial interests of the town, by my measure, had established tyranny in New York by supporting both machines. When I became police commissioner of New York, I made it one of my first orders of business to visit the deplorable living conditions of many of the city's populace. And I witnessed firsthand the debauchery and theft that was going on, blithely ignored by the city's bribed policemen. Well, as you can well imagine, I would have none of that. We were able to make quite a few improvements, but we were dogged by both machines every step of the way. Mr. Platt was very glad to be rid of me when I left New York to become Assistant Secretary of the Navy but he was thoroughly put out when the people of New York elected me governor later against his express wishes. <laughs> I must tell you the truth. I never wanted to become vice president. The job is tiresome and menial and has precious little opportunity for action. As a matter of fact, I went to visit President McKinley in May of 1900 
to tell him that I was not interested in the position, only to find out I wasn't being considered for the position in the first place. <laughs> it was all part of a grand scheme by Mr. Platt to try to rid me as governor of New York, and he was encouraged by the uh, industrial interests that were angered by all the reforms we had put in place. The whole subject is rather tiresome, and I will leave it after making one more point. I've always begin, become quite nervous just before elections, and those who operate in the shadow of politics like it that way. However, I can honestly say that the American people, the citizenry, have never let me down. And disappointing those who would rule through money and deceit always provides me with an immense amount of satisfaction. As a matter of fact, my inauguration four years ago, thanks entirely to divine providence and the votes of the American people, was the grandest day of my life. I only wish Father had been there to see it. Next question, please. Mr. President, we've heard many differing reports of, from the press about the Rough Riders and the Battle of San Juan Hill. Can you tell us your eyewitness account? Well, it is quite the battle. Now, time does not permit me to go into the detail I would wish, but I can attempt to be brief while honoring those incredibly brave men that served in that battle. You see, San Juan Heights, overlooking Santiago, had become the key ground in shaking loose Admiral Cervera's naval squadron, which was held up, holed up in Santiago Harbor, protected by naval minefields. Now, our own Navy had superior weapons and firepower, but they could not advance without being forced to choose between the Spanish naval guns and the minefields. So there was nothing for it but for our ground troops to advance on that hill through hellish jungle and blasted heat. Despite idiotic leadership by General Shafter, blast that man! He would not feed or supply his troops, but neither would he advance them out of a fear for ruining his own reputation. Forgive me. The 9th, 10th, and 1st Cavalries had advanced to the base of the hills, but they were pinned down there under artillery shrapnel rounds exploding overhead, as well as Spanish sharpshooters on the crest of the hill. Furthermore, my Rough Riders were pinned down on an open road under direct enemy fire. So I saddled up and ordered them to advance by sections up the hill only to be blocked by the regulars who were waiting for orders. So I said, if you don't want to move forward, then let my men pass. That showed them, and they joined in the rush, which overpowered the sharpshooters and allowed our Gatling guns to join in the fight. I had to abandon my horse near the top thanks to a barbed wire fence, but by Jove, we made it. By all rights, I should not have survived. One in three men was either out due to heat, prostration, or malaria, or wounded, or dead. As a matter of fact, on the advance, two Spaniards rose up to shoot me. I shot at both with my revolver and killed one. I can only credit Providence. The sight of our flags on the crest of the hill caused Admiral Sempera to try to make a run for it. But Admiral Sampson and our ships gave chase and destroyed the entire squadron. The ground troops, few that were in the city, held on for two weeks out of some sense of honor. But the stars and stripes were erected in Santiago 16 days later. Bully. Next question, please. Sir, if I may ask, just 
on another lighter matter. What can you tell us about the origins of the teddy bear? <laughs> well, truth be told, I'm quite humbled by that question, which has precious little to do with my accomplishments. I was down south, uh, horseback riding, in Mississippi and hunting. But game was scarce that day. Near sunset, some of the locals used dogs to track down and rope a rather scruffy black bear. They presented it for me to shoot. Well, as you can imagine, there is a significant difference between hunting for sport and simple butchery. I refused. As I recall, some members of the press, uh, most, most uh, notably Mr. Clifford Berryman, made quite a deal of the story. I can still recall the caption to the cartoon, Drawing the Line in Mississippi. <laughs> At any rate, there is a toy and candy shop in New York City run by Mr. Rose and, uh, excuse me, by Mrs. Rose and Mr. Morris Mictum. They heard the story and came up with the idea of a bear being used as a source of comfort and softness rather than ferocity. Hmm. They made the first two bears by hand. I should mention that bears were not the way I related to my children. Archie and Quentin used to love to pretend that I was a bear attacking them which led to some quite bully pillow fights and wrestling, as I can tell you. <laughs> but the victims made two bears and called them Teddy's Bears. And they sold almost immediately. Mrs. Mictum made a third bear and sent it to us as a present for my children, along with a letter requesting permission for the use of my name. I did not think that my name would be of much use in the toy bear business, so I wrote back giving permission. Divine providence intervened yet again, and now I'm being told that they are sold quite widely. If I'm not mistaken, that third bear is in Ethel's bedroom even as we speak. It was quite clearly crafted with a great deal of love. Next question, please. Mr. Roosevelt, in your life you've done so many and so varied things. Of all of your accomplishments, what would you say would have the most far-reaching results down the road? Well, you would expect to me to talk about my time with the Rough Riders, but that was not my accomplishment. It was that of the brave and cunning men who served under General Leonard Wood and myself. I was rather proud of the achievement of the Panama Canal, especially since France and Colombia had thoroughly failed at that effort. And I did enjoy the gains we were able to make against the uh, corruption of Tammany Hall and Platt's machines. In the final analysis, I would say that far-reaching results, as determined by history, will be decided long after my death. I leave it to your grandchildren to answer that question. Next question, please. Mr. President, what in your opinion are the prospects for the country? Do you have a dream for our country? Oh, I can easily summarize my dream, which should be that of every person in public office. To make the world a better place for our children to live in. We must care for the treasures of nature. We must care for the treasures of our troops, and we must care for every American citizen, the greatest treasure of all. The citizenry must not be trivialized. They must not be deceived. They must not be squandered for the sake of power wielded by a few money, persons, or interests. As I have said, my father repeated so often, God requires that good fortune be balanced with productive work and public service. May we continue to cultivate that in every American citizen. If we do, my 
Good man, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. Mr. President, how would you like to be remembered? As an author, a teacher, a big game hunter, a president, a father, a husband, or a soldier of fortune? <laughs> Another question for history. Let me think. I reject all of your choices, sir, in favor of another word which I believe encompasses them all. A steward. A man who was able to care assiduously for all that he was able to affect. If, in looking down for my reward, I am remembered for that, I shall consider myself blessed indeed. What is the time? Goodness, Archie and Quentin have been waiting for me to read to them. It is a terrible thing for a boy to be made to wait. I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention and your forbearance, and I wish you all a good evening. Archie, Quentin, here comes the bear! <laughs> Yes, sir. 
And he talked about his days as a rancher out in Dakota. He had a lot of fun. <laughs> All of life's activities be approached with an eye to zeal and joy. I didn't focus on those days because, frankly, those were more before he had his children. And I wanted to spend the majority of this emphasizing his family. Any others? Sir? Briefly, what happened to the children? Well, again, uh, Ted went on to public office, uh, didn't rise as far. Um, Kermit pretty much stayed with the family. Um, Ethel was one of the founding members of the American Red Cross and was, thank, was uh, responsible for most of, its, um, uh, most of its early successes. And I frankly did not read much about what became of Archie and Quentin. I think if it was today, they'd probably be on America's Most Wanted. <laughs> Any, any others? Very well. Thank you once again for your kind attention and forbearance. If you'd like to uh, copy down these references we have, I'll have them out here uh, when we're done. Uh, thanks once again to Christina Aubrey and uh, Margaret Kerchief for their work in setting up this event. Um, please uh, don't leave any room unfilled in the donation jars on your way out because that is what enables events like this to take place. Thank you all once again.